G'day guys and gal, it's been a while since I've shined a light on a particular Space Marine chapter and I'd honestly thought I'd already covered all the good ones that have more than one small wiki page of lore, but there's a few hidden gems that I've avoided my eye of Sauron. Underrated chapters with rich interesting lore and plenty of badass moments. The Crimson Fists are one of these chapters. A second founding chapter, these Sons of Dawn have existed for over 10,000 years, being created at the same time as various other legendary chapters, such as the Black Templars. Whilst they might look like and occasionally act like Dalla Ultramarines, who just fisted their woman on the wrong time of the month, the Crimson Fists have earned their own legend and they also have incredibly dope-ass artworks. Before we get started, with the pandemic hopefully wrapping up, Australia's international borders opening up and the sense of freedom emerging, you might not think you need a VPN. But that's where you'd be sadly mistaking. Introducing the February Surfshark Sponsorship, aka the longest running sponsor of this channel. I really don't know why they keep renewing my contract. A VPN, for the three of you that probably haven't heard of one, is a software that allows you to access the internet of other countries. Why do you want access to the internet of other countries? Because life isn't fair. Shitty licensing deals make streaming services for some countries, like Australia, vastly inferior to others. A VPN also masks your IP, so if you're worried about your internet security while you're browsing, a VPN will protect your identity as you browse the more um, questionable parts of the internet. So why choose Surfshark over the other VPNs? Well, firstly, they put up with my shit. And their interface is incredibly easy to use, like one click and bang, you're in. On top of that, Surfshark is offering a massive 83% off and three months free if you use my link in code below. And if for some unfathomable reason you're unsatisfied, then Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee. Cheers to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Today we'll go over the history of the Crimson Fists, highlighting their special characters, key moments, and interesting snippets of lore before wrapping up with what they're currently up to. Let's get into it. To set the scene, Horus has just caused the mother of all ruckuses. Many Primarchs are dead, legions have been shattered, and the Emperor is now a big ass lithium iron battery. Rogel Dawn, the Emperor's most stoic son, the Primarch with the greatest will of them all, has finally broken after carrying his father's corpse to his golden prison. The Imperial Fists forsake their defensive ways and become incredibly divided. Some of them weaponize their autism and call for vengeance. These Fists became the Black Templars led by the legendary Sigismund. Other Fists maintain their yellow armor and continue to follow their Primarch, whilst others got all weird and painted their armor purple and kind of got a bit heretical later on, like the Soul Drinkers. As you can see, a lot of mental instability happening here. There was another new chapter though, one that looked at its brother chapters and thought they had gotten a bit too full on and needed to take a bit of a chill pill. These were the Crimson Fists, led by the extremely large and level-headed Alexis Pollux. Alexis was a legend. Although not as flashy as Sigismund, Alexis beat and nearly had Perturabo killed in a spaceship battle and impressed the Loyalist Primarchs time and time again. Before we continue with the old history lesson, why were they called the Crimson Fists and what's up with their ultramarine vibe? Well, the Imperial Fist Captains used to do that thing where they would cut their hand and then handshake their Primarch. This was done because A, it's cool, and B, having their Primarch's raw blood mixing with their own gave them a cheeky little power boost. To honour this tradition and to remind the audience that they weren't an ultramarine successor chapter, the Crimson Fists adopted this as their name, logo, and they literally paint one or two of their hands red depending on their rank. Their blue armour represents the fact that out of all the Imperial Fist successors, they were the ones that didn't see the newly written Codex Astartes, which was a book written by Gilliman on how not to be a fuckwit, as little more than toilet paper. The Crimson Fist could be summed up by calling them a mix between Ultramarine and Imperial Fist. With a level head, young recruits, and a girthy Alexis at the helm, the Crimson Fist took part in the scouring, cleansing the Imperium of the traitorous filth that nearly brought them low. From there, the new chapter achieved victory after victory, a notable one being crushing the Exodite Elder on Urulek Prime, allowing the planet to flourish into a key Imperial world. Once again, as cool as Space Cells riding dinosaurs is, they don't seem to do too hot against orbital bombardment and devastator squads. Who knew? Alexis would go on to lead his chapter for eight centuries, bringing them honor and glory, before he was finally cut down when an alien managed to spit venom at his head. Despite that, Alexis was able to survive for days due to sheer force of will, uncovering the methods on how to defeat the Xeno and passing on these orders before he finally died a hero. 
Alexis is so revered that even 10,000 years later, the Crimson Fists refer to him as Big Daddy Pollux. The chapter would then be led by Chapter Master Quaestra for a time. Don't worry if you haven't heard about him. He has no real lore beyond getting absolutely fucking splattered during the War of the Beast which was a random period of time after the Horus Heresy where the Orcs became extremely powerful, Vulcan reappeared then died again, and the entire Imperial Fist chapter went extinct and had to be rebuilt from GNC taking from its successors. During the Age of Apostasy, the Crimson Fists led the Crusade of Righteous Liberation, where they basically cleaned up and retook 84 worlds that had fallen to anarchy during the reign of that dick Georges Van Dyer. Due to the fact that they were a fleet-based chapter, as well as the fact that they didn't replenish any of their numbers during the entire crusade, only 128 Astartes remained by the time their bloody work was done. That's a nearly 90% reduction in chapter numbers, but considering they took 84 worlds, that's a pretty solid effort. The Crimson Fists would prove themselves reliable and capable time and time again, defending worlds from various Xenos, mostly Orcs and Eldar. They were chosen as one of the most pure and reliable chapters, so much so that the High Lords of Terror and even the Inquisition would reach out to them for aid whenever they needed to put down a renegade chapter. This was a huge compliment, as the Imperium always gets nervous about chapters that were born loyalist, but later became renegade. Sending an unreliable chapter to deal with renegades might result in that chapter getting corrupted as well, but not the red and blue boys. After various victories over the Orcs in the Loki sector, the Crimson Fists were finally given their own home planet as a thank you. Rin's world it was called, and it was actually quite nice. The Crimson Fists were pretty stoked about it. The Crimson Fists also gained a lot of reputation amongst the Orcs. Even for Space Marines, they were unusually good at killing the Greenskins. Their current day chapter master, Pedro Cantor, is a living legend, having led his battle brothers to numerous triumphs over the Fungal Menace. Many Orcs rose to challenge the Fists, and many failed, but not all. See, there was this angry war boss called Snagrod that kind of came out of nowhere and massacred an Imperial planet. Feeling pretty stoked about himself, he then declared he would attack Rin's world next and bring the legendary Crimson Fists to their knees. This was a foolish declaration. The Crimson Fists were at full strength and they had time to prepare. They had inherited supreme fortification abilities from their gene father and they seemingly had the plot armor of Ultramarines. It was pretty much a guaranteed victory for the Loyalists until something really fucking retarded happened. The Crimson Fists accidentally nuked their own fortress monastery as the Orcs were invading. This destroyed the monastery, killed 600 Marines, which was over half the entire chapter, and it forced the survivors led by Pedro to cross the planet, fighting tooth and nail the entire time, losing Astartes the entire time, to reach the world's capital city. Although they began the war with over 1,000 Marines, by the time they had reached the city and could prepare to actually fight, they were down 80% of their entire chapter. Bruh. Despite this, they were able to hold off the Orc army for 18 months, until it finally fell due to an overwhelming amount of Orc Gargants. As it fell, Imperial reinforcements arrived and saved the day. Only about 100 Crimson Fists still lived, but here's the kicker. Snargrod's war wasn't even close to being done, hence Pedro and his few remaining warriors led the war effort in cleansing the entire world of Orc Taint, losing even more battle brothers in the process. Their numbers got so low that it looked as if the Crimson Fists would disband and be absorbed by other Imperial Fist successes, but if there is one thing Pedro and his chapter are known for, it's never giving up. Hence the Crimson Fists rebuilt their forces to continue their glorious purpose. The Crimson Fists were a generic force used to fight generic enemies. I don't mean that in a negative way, that's just kind of how it was. They didn't use any particularly wild or fancy tactics, and their Gene C didn't do any weird fucky shit. As such, they were perfect when it came to fighting Elder and Orcs, but they seem to have been kept away from more unique enemies, such as the Necrons, Dark Elder, or Tyranids. In recent times, they've fought more and more against Chaos, as the threat of the Ruinous Powers have increased and they've done a good job of it, seemingly winning nearly all of their encounters with Hell that they've had so far. So what is Pedro and his Crimson Fist up to in the current setting, since Gilliman's resurrection? Well, just as they had rebuilt their chapter, Cadia fell and the galaxy shat the bed. A fuck off huge demonic horde invaded Rin's world, and basically undid all the progress Pedro had done for the last few hundred years, and killed most of his chapter. Despite his best efforts, and boy did he put in a hell of a fight, his world was doomed. Until it fucking wasn't! Gilliman charged in at the last moment like Space Rohan, and he destroyed the demonic legions. He then told Pedro that his father would have been proud of him, which was actually very wholesome. Pedro was then given primarily 
Samaras reinforcements which fixed all these issues and brought the Crimson Fist back to fighting strength. The first thing Pedro did with his new invigorated chapter was to taunt the nearby Orc Wars, and he told them that he would fuck them all up. Fair enough, Pedro doesn't like Orcs. The Crimson Fists were last seen fighting in the War of the Beasts, being instrumental in the defense of Vigilus, which is a very important world, massacring Orcs, gene stealers, and other undesirables. I want to note that even though the Crimson Fists have spent quite a lot of time at only 10% chapter size due to various wars and unfortunate self-nukings, they never sat idle to recover their numbers. Even as they rebuilt their chapter, Pedro would take elite small strike teams to war zones to achieve subtle but important objectives. For example, there was this fearsome Cornite warlord who invaded a planet with a huge ass army. At the height of his power, the Cornite army numbered in the billions. The Crimson Fist squad of 30 marines went around the world, destabilizing the planet's thermal macro reactors. By the time their mission was complete and they withdrew, only 10 of them had died. However, when the thermal reactors went kaput, the resulting firestorm killed 86% of the Cornite army and left the rest in disarray. Not exactly Korn's ideal format for bloodshed. With only a small portion of the Cornite forces left, the Mechanicus swoops in, massacres them like dogs, and easily takes the planet, all thanks to 30 Crimson Fists. When I said the Crimson Fists were a bit vanilla before, I want to clarify. They do have a unique and interesting mentality and attitude. Sure, they are incredibly duty driven, never disobeying orders given to them by the Imperium, but they also have a strong moral compass and they don't relish their more distasteful deeds. When they had to put down a renegade chapter, the Marine Vigilant, who, due to Xeno exposure, refused to fight anyone, the Crimson Fists were disturbed and they were upset by the culling they undertook. Likewise, Pedro has faced numerous hard decisions, where he's had to choose between doing his duty or doing what is right. They aren't like the Minotaurs who are the ruthless, obedient attack dogs of the High Lords, nor are they the Space Wolves who only do what they believe is right. They are stuck somewhere in the middle, and I for one am keen to see what Pedro and his red-handed brothers do next. If you enjoyed the video and you want to support the channel, then Patreon is the place to be. We're only $1 per month to give you access to a boatload of hentai. Hit the subscribe button and hit the real subscribe button for more bloody handed content. Join the Discord for more memes and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.